So, uh, yeah, I'm going to talk to you about interactive email, um, which is kind of a new trend in the email world. Um, there is an email world, uh, out, sort of aside from the web development, there are a lot of email developers about, um, and it's sort of a growing industry as well. Um, so I'm Mark Robbins. Um, yeah, I work for Rebel Mail, um, who, and we only build email. I haven't professionally worked on a website for uh, over two years now. Um, I just made a one-page site for a friend of mine the other day. Otherwise, I haven't done anything web for over two years. Um, so yeah, there's no time for questions afterwards. But if you tell me anything on Twitter, m underscore j underscore Robbins, or at go Rebel Mail, um, I'll get back to you at some point. Um, but yeah, just send me messages. Um, oh, is that working? No. Oh, hang on. I forgot the important bit. There we go. <laughs> Got to plug it in first. So what is interactive email? Um, this is the definition we use at Rebel Mail. It's an action taken in an email that triggers an event within the same email. So traditionally speaking, email marketing, you will send a link, uh, send some text, send some images. But basically, you're getting somebody to click a link and go to a website. With interactive email, you're getting somebody to click and do actions within the email, which is keeping them in the email, but you're, you're giving them more information. You're sh showing some stuff around. So it's, it's um, everything contained in a single email. So these types of interactions, I sort of categorize them into two types. Um, the first one is fleeting interactions, uh, what, what I've called fleeting interactions. So these are your basic hover, focus, active. So I'm sure you've all used these class, these pseudo classes before. So the reason I, I call them fleeting is because the, the CSS statement is only true for as long as the action is true. So hover, this is only hover. This effect is only working for as long as my mouse is hovering over this block of code. Focus is only true for as long as that element is in focus. And active is only true for as long as the mouse is held down. Now, interestingly here, you can, you can combine focus and hover if you do focus first. But that's the only way you can combine these. So there's, yeah, you can do some, some stuff like you know, making these things fall over. But there's not. Uh, it's not a huge amount of functionality in that. So for that, we go to the checkbox hack, which again is something I'm sure you may have seen in web development. Um, and we use it in email as well. Um, so here, where's my mouse gone? There we go. Um, this is now true. This statement is now true for as long as that checkbox is checked. So it's more like an on-off switch. It, it's got two values of checked or the default value. And then the same thing with radio buttons. Um, but the good thing with radio buttons is when you check a different one in the same array, you lose the checked value of another radio button. So all of these things are adding up to a lot of possibilities that we're, we're, we're using. And then you can have a number of arrays of radio buttons, so you can just add more and more functionality. So um, take you through to my first couple of examples. So. Here we have, let's pull these in. Oops. Here's a gallery and some hotspots. So the gallery, if you think of it, there's four radio buttons there, one for each of the images. So you check the, the radio button and the changes the image. So now we have that image, and then just check the next radio button. And then each one corresponds to an image. So it changed the image. Also, it changed the highlighting on the thumbnails. Um, and also, interestingly, people say, why, why do people know to use this in email? Like, this, is not, this doesn't work in email. How are you users react to it? And it's, it's a gallery. It looks like a gallery. If I scroll down a little bit further in this email, you can see there's a blue, blue square with white text in it. That's obviously a button. But how do you know it's a button? It's just a rectangle with text in it. In the same way, users instantly know that this is a gallery. It's a large image with four small images below it. So that's sort of the, um, 
user interface is sort of there, the user experience is, is learned from the web and from sort of a long history of using the like, websites. We can pull this into uh, email. So then um, the next example is this hotspots one. Um, here we've got six radio buttons, one for each of the products. There's actually, there's actually uh, 12 radio buttons in here because each one of them has got a close button as well. So we open it up, and then when that radio button is checked, it enlarges that content. So that the corresponding content is transformed to you know, scale one from scale zero to scale one, and positioning as well. And then in the top corner, we've got a little close button. So that's just another radio button in the same array that does nothing. The per sole purpose of that, that little x there is to take the checked value away from the radio button that is making the content show. So we've got we six of these in here. Just close them down. So let's get these off and go to, sorry. It takes a little while to get these over. I can't quite see my mouse. There it is. OK, so the way that we link the clicks to the inputs. Um, we've got this code up here, the type radio button, ID foo, label for foo. So that's pretty standard stuff. However, with webmail, uh, Gmail strips out all classes and IDs. So then you have this ID of, well, that'll be stripped out, so that doesn't exist anymore, and then a label for foo. So this label is now associated to nothing. Uh, Yahoo, on the other hand, will prefix and edit the IDs and classes. So it changes ID foo to ID yui underscore three underscore one six underscore zero underscore and so on. So for Yahoo, you'll have the input would have an ID of, of yui underscore and it'll have a label for foo. So again, they don't match. So this doesn't work. Uh, however, my slides are out of date. Last night, I got. I was out for dinner, and as I came back, I got a load of messages on my phone, and Gmail have announced they're now going to support class and ID. So that's good. And now they also, Gmail, are going to support media queries. So Gmail uh, mobile app will now be responsive, which is amazing. They've had, uh, <laughs> they've had G uh, media queries on the desktop Gmail for, for a few years now, but actually me media queries in mobile where it's useful. Uh, they've only just added that last night. Well, it's, it's come in the next coming weeks, so they've just told us they're going to add it. Um, so this is the way we work with the webmail, with nesting labels. So bear with me here. This is start, it's where it starts to get a little complicated. So at the top here, we have a label, and it's closed at the bottom. Inside that label, the first child inside that label is the input, is the radio button. So when that input is the first child of the label, clicking anywhere in that label will then activate that input. So I can click anywhere in that, and that will check that radio button. So then I've put the image, which I want to show, and the thumbnail at the bottom. So this is a basic gallery. So this thumbnail at the bottom is within the label, so that will check the radio button. So then inside that, we put another label. And then that label has an input and a div with an image and then a div with a thumbnail. And inside that, there's another label, another input, another, another div, another label. So this sort of starts nesting. And there's only three here. You can, you can expand this to have hundreds if you wanted. Um, and the CSS is, is really simple for this. It's just uh, if the input is checked, and it's using the sibling selector, so plus div, display block. So if this input is checked, show this image. If this one is checked, then show this image. And then to highlight the thumbnail that is selected, you have the input that's checked plus div plus label plus div. So this input is checked, which is a sibling of this div, which is a sibling of this label, which is a sibling of this div down here. So we're using the, the direct sibling selector because the general sibling selector isn't supported in webmail. 
well, well in AOL it is, but uh, that's why we have to string them together a bit. So yeah, it does get frustrating. Um, so I'll talk a bit about the support and fallbacks. Um, everybody always asks, does it work in Outlook? It doesn't work in Outlook. <sighs> but nobody uses Outlook, so it's OK. Um, so the way we, we deal with this, the uh, support and the fallbacks, is we, we group every email client into one of three groups, into static, limited, or interactive. So the interactive group of email clients are email clients that support all the cool stuff. So you get the full interactivity. Everything I'm going to show you works in these interactive email clients. Uh, this limited is sort of you know, like your webmail email clients, where you've got some interactivity, but then they strip out some of the more advanced cool stuff. And then the static is where nothing works. That's, that's where Outlook is. Um, so I've just sort of at the bottom here, I've got um, this is like an Outlook conditional comment, very similar to the uh, IE conditional comments. Um, so that's to, yeah, Outlook doesn't support this. And also anything that strips out your style doesn't support this, obviously. But that accounts for like 20% of opens. Um, and these, these statistics, these, these uh, percentages here, are taken from a website called emailclientmarketshare.com, which is a website put together by Litmus, who do email testing. Uh, really good, good guys. And they, uh, they were doing email and analytics. So they base that on about, it's about 1 billion opens a month that they have, um, which in the grand scheme of things, actually, is, is, it's not huge, but a billion is quite a large number, right? So that's, it's got to be relatively, relatively good stats. And actually, this, we back this up with the stats that we get from anything we send. So 20% of those are static. 19% of those lie in the limited section, and then 61% will be interactive. So that means 80% of people have the potential to receive interactive email to, to some level of interactivity. So that's pretty significant, 80% there. Um, I'll just go through. So for the limited, we just need this checked. We need, you know, need to be able to detect checked in the CSS, and we need the sibling selector. Um, and then for interactive, we can do the cool stuff. So we've just got. Uh, Anything like WebKit based, all the cool, cool bits like that. All the good email clients are based on WebKit. Um, and yeah, general sibling selector. I'll just give you a quick demo of what they, they look like. So first of all, let's have a look at the static. That's it. It doesn't do anything. It's just static. So the limited. Here we've got a gallery. And I can just jump around to say, oh, actually, look, this is quite a Quite a nice hotel room. Oh, look, it's a huge hotel room. Oh, wow, look at this view. So you can see a lot more um, with, the, with the gallery. But it's a little boring. It's a bit jumpy, sort of jumping between these. It just, just changes the image. So if you want to add a little bit of style, a little finesse, then you go into the interactive version, where we can just do a nice little fade between the images. Also, um, I've got the arrows here, so I can just do a continuous scroll through the images if I wanted to as well. Uh, so that takes me on to the more advanced way of doing it. So the nesting labels is cool, and that works in the limited clients. But then the next sort of the, the advanced way of doing it is the punch card coding, what I've called punch card coding, which is where you have a large number of radio buttons and checkboxes, and you put them at the very top of the document. And you can then, based on what's checked there, you can change any part of the document. So I was working on an email um, a while ago. I'll show it to you in a minute. I used, I think it's 117 radio buttons. Um, and, I, and I had them, usually they'll be hidden, but I had them visible so I could see what I was doing and like, it was just a bit of bug fixing. And it looked a little something like that, that image on the left. So that's a load of radio buttons. Then on the right, that's an old IBM punched card. And there's a lot of similarities between the two. Radio buttons can be checked or not checked. A punch card can be punched or not punched. So if you look at it like that, then they're all true and false values. So they're either true or false, checked or unchecked, punched or not punched, or one and zero. Then you start looking at it like it's binary, and then it opens up a whole load of crazy ideas. Um, so then you start stringing these selectors together. So 
That's this little snippet of CSS is based on something I have used. I, I changed the names and a bit just so it's a bit more readable. Um, so the idea here is item A3 is checked. So I'd have an array of radio buttons called item A, one, two, three, four, five, say. And number three is checked. That's the sibling of B6, which is checked. That's the sibling of C2, which is checked, which is the sibling of D11, which is checked, which is the sibling of E5, which is not checked. So we can use the not selector as well. So we can say any of the other items in E could be checked. None of them could be checked. Just as long as 5 isn't checked, then this statement is still true. So we carry on down. F2 is checked. G5 is checked. That's the sibling of a div, the class of foo, and display none. So that's quite an elaborate way of hiding something. But when you start putting it into the demos that I'm going to show you, it makes a bit more sense that you can string these together. And one thing is relevant to another. So I'm going to show you another demo. This is um, the first. This, actually, no, it's the second interactive email I built. The first one was just using a hover value, so I don't really count it. So this one um, uses six radio buttons. Um, there's a little game. It's got a score counter. Uh, the game gets progressively harder as you play it, and there's a prize at the end. So the idea is it's Thwackavol, which is based on the old Whack-A-Mole game, but that was copyrighted. So you thwack a vole, you score a point, and you whack a mole, you'll lose a point for copyright infringement. I take this very seriously. Um, <laughs> so I'll just show you how it works. Uh, let's have a quick, oh, hang on, I'm cheating. I know the pattern. There we go. That's one point. So you can see the score counter at the bottom going. And as I'm scoring the points, the game speeds up. So the animation reverses and speeds up as I play it. Four and. Oh, missed him. Damn it. Five. The winner, now visit my site. I got bored at that point and stopped designing. So the idea here is you could send this in a campaign, and the, the user receives a game. They play a game. They complete a game. They earn a prize. Give them a discount code or something like that. And then they feel like they've earned their discount. If you just say, here's 10% off. Some people use it, some people won't. If people earn that 10%, th those people who bother to play and earn it will convert much higher because they've got that sense of achievement that they've earned their, their reward. You could even tie the discount into the, the points. So you score a point, you get 5%. Score another point, 10%, 15%, 20% discount, and then go visit the shop and buy something. So this is just a concept. I haven't uh, sent a campaign with a game in it yet. I'm still waiting for someone to agree to let me do that. But um, yeah, this is just a, just the concept email for now. But it, it it's uh, it proves a point, I think. Let's just get rid of that. Where am I going? Oh, ooh, sorry, straight into another demo. Um, so this is a shopping cart. So this is the one where it said 117 radio buttons. We also have four checkboxes. Um, we have the ability to add and remove products. We've got multi-page layout. We can edit options. And we've got form validation. So this is based on uh, an abandoned cart email um, that we we're working out. Again, this one's a concept. Um, but we do have a version of this very nearly ready to send in the next month or so. Um, so I'll show you a couple of things with this one. Um, so you've got yeah, a pair of trousers there uh, and a quantity selector. So you can just change the quantity here. You can move it down, or I can just remove it completely from the cart, add it back in. So you can just add and remove products and change the quantity. But what's cool with this is as I'm changing the quantity, if you just look to the right there, then it's also changing the price. And at the bottom, it's also changing the subtotal, the tax, the discount, and the total price. And that's all CSS. So that works with CSS counters. So CSS counters are usually used for ordered lists or something like that, so, or maybe page title headings and things like that. Um, what I've done here is I've used the, the values for prices. So for example, this pair of socks at the bottom here is $12. 
So if item one is checked, oh, uh, sorry, item three, quantity one, is checked, then the counter increment is 12. If two is checked, the counter increment is 24. So then it's, it's just counting the one value there. And then the same thing is, as that goes up, the counter increment of the subtotal, the counter increment of the tax, the discount, and the total price all increase as you change the quantity. Um, so the next thing, um, so yeah, that's a nice, that's a nice hoodie, um, but I want to change it, change the color. So if I just click through, it loads a new page, it loads a product page. <laughs> Although if you think back to what I said at the beginning, if you're going off the, the email, then it's not interactive. It's only interactive if the stuff happens in the email. So this is a fake new page. So on this email, I've got one, two, three, four, five, six pages. So each page is wrapped in a, in a container, in, in a div, and then I have six radio buttons. So when the home page radio button is checked, the home page shows. When the product one page radio button is checked, then product one is shown. So then within this, um, as well, I've got a little gallery, and I'm just going to change the color to red. And I'm going to change the size to large there as well, um, just because the size of the pizza I had at, at lunch was massive. So then you can see here the color's changed in the, thing, in, the, in the small image, the color name has changed here, and the size has also changed. So then each, each one of these um, you know, changed the, the trousers as well. Let's put that size 30, and then jump back, and then that changes as well. So I've done the edit options. Form validation. So yeah, you can do form validation with HTML, which is cool. Um, doesn't work that well in email, though. So what we do is we do form validation with CSS. <laughs> uh. So if I click, if I click by now, I'm over enthusiastic. I haven't, you know, read what I'm supposed to do. Oh no, I need to fill out the form properly. So first of all, um, add a shipping address. So just click in the drop down. Um, these drop down menus are also powered by CSS. So we could use select menus, but then you can't detect the value, the checked values of select menus in the same way you can with radio buttons. So this is, yeah, built again with radio buttons, and just to focus on the just to focus, to show it open, is, is the focus value. So I select an address, uh, select a card, and then just confirm that I'm happy to buy it. And then as you click Buy Now, all that, all that data is then sent through to the server, which will then process the order and charge the card, and then goes through to the warehouse, and the products get shipped out. So a complete checkout process, all in email, and you only ever see the website when you click that Buy Now button, and it says, thank you for your order. So you don't really need a website. Right, Ooh, where am I going? Yeah. OK, so one of the things that you have on web which is really good is analytics. So we wanted to get analytics into this as well. Um, traditionally, email analytics is you put uh, a tiny little one pixel um, tracking image into the email. If the email's opened and images are on, then that pixel will fire. You re record that, that request for that image on the server, and then you track that as an open. So we've expanded on that. So every click now will trigger a tracking image. So here's sort of an example of the code. So if image one is checked, then load the background image for image one. So you know every click that the user has done. Um, and you know, there's, there's brands who are now using this information to retarget and, and remarket to, to people based on the clicks in the email, which they previously wouldn't have known about. Um, we also, like I said about earlier, the static limited interactive versions, we track that so you know exactly what the user sees. 
um, because obviously there's slight design changes between them. So you might see better performance on limited, in which case your interactive is probably going over overboard. But more, more commonly, you'll see the interactive outperforming the limited. So it's worthwhile putting the uh, little transitions on. Um, so there are some restrictions as well, as you'd expect with email. Um, you've got file size limited to 102 kilobytes. That is through Gmail will clip your, your email if it goes over that file size. So will Yahoo. And actually, quite a lot of spam filters will increase the spam score if you go over 102 kilobytes. Um, CSS is limited to about 12,000 characters in Gmail. Uh, I haven't re-measured this since their new announcement, but uh, I, yeah, I assume it's about the same. Hopefully, they're going to increase that soon. Um, ESPs can break your code. So that's email service providers, so whoever you send your email through. A lot of them will strip out bits of HTML and CSS. A lot of them will add bits of CSS and HTML. So that breaks the code. So you've got a beautiful bit of code, and they break it. Um, you need a device lab for testing. I use um, like tools like Litmus and Email and Acid, which are great. You send an email to them, they'll return about 40, um, uh, about 40 different screenshots. So the, um, but that's great for static testing. You can see the layout. But the interactive testing, you actually need to get in there and click it. So a screenshot isn't good enough. So you need a device lab. Uh, also, email clients have no beta versions, no docs, and no release notes. Although Gmail have just changed that again. Um, so Gmail have now released a list of supported CSS. Um, but generally speaking, stuff changes. So I could send out an email campaign, send a million emails out at uh, 9 o'clock in the morning, and by 10 o'clock, the rendering could have changed. And there's nothing you can do about it. But that's not just interactive email. That's in email as a whole that that happens with. So I'm going to show you a couple of uh, little fun examples. So, oops, lost my mouse again. Where am I going? There we are. Um, so I've got a little puzzle slider. I'll stick that over here. Oh, there's my code pen at the bottom there. So if you want to actually look at the code of these, you can, you can do. They don't do it right now. Gives away the magic. Oops, come on. There we go. And it's a little phone. So let's start with the phone. So this, as you can see, is an iPhone. Um, so it's the 3D product view concept, bit of fun that I, I built. Um, so this, you can just rotate this image on three separate axes to get uh, any view you want of it. You can also just do a little zoom out, zoom back in, reset it. So the way this works is, Actually, the rotation is based on what I talked about earlier uh, of the fleeting interaction of active. So I have three divs wrapping the phone. Uh, one is set to rotate x, one is set to rotate y, and one is set to rotate z. And these are all animations are set to play state paused. So if I click this rotation, I think that's x. I always get these confused. Um, so as long as that mouse is held down, as long as I'm holding down the button there, the animation play state is set to running. So this will just keep flipping until I let go. And the same with the other two. Oops. And then that one. And then it's just, yeah, 3D transforms on the CSS to make the sides of the phone. Um, as you can see, it's a bit blocky. I could, have, I could spend a little bit more time rounding the corners off, but it's never going to be perfect, so I'll just leave it at that. Next one, uh, puzzle slider. So when I was a kid, we used to go on long car journeys, and me and my brother would sit in the back and argue all the time. Uh, my parents got frustrated, and they bought us little games, such as puzzle sliders, little plastic game where you've got these nine tiles and eight, I'm sorry, eight tiles and nine positions for them. So you can just move around the tiles as you would in the game. Um, let's see how, 
Uh, where's that one going? That one goes up there. There we go. That's, uh, you can sort of see where it's going there. I'm not very good at these. Um, but each, each tile has six radio buttons associated to it. Uh, for left, center, and right, and then for top, middle, and bottom. And from those six radio buttons, you can get any of the nine positions on the board. So then we have little arrows attached to each of the tiles, so you can just move them around quite easily. And you can only see the arrows which are clickable. Um, otherwise, you could just overlap tiles, and that wouldn't really work. Um, so there we go. Oops. Sorry. There we go. Yeah, so the code for these, um, both of these, and a few other things I've got are on my code pen. So it's just codepen.io slash m underscore j underscore robins. If you want to have a look and play around with that code, then feel free. And if you do send anything using it, let me know, because uh, I'm always interested. Um, so next example. Ah, this is my last example. And finally, um, this last example is, I'll just show you here, is the presentation. <laughs> so this whole, whole presentation, the whole presentation is contained in a single email. <laughs> if I was just to, just to click on the, on the and finally there, you can see all the radio buttons at the top. <laughs> and uh, so to check, yeah, as I was scrolling through the slides, you move the mouse over, and then the clicker is just a mouse click. So I'm just clicking through, just clicking on a label to move backwards and forwards through the radio buttons. You can see the radio buttons change at the top there. Um, but also, there's, there's a few other things you could do. Um, do you know what? I always forget to start my timer, but I've built a timer. So if I click there, you can see in the bottom right corner, there's a timer starts. That's, again, CSS timer. Um, just animation, step animation moving through the, through the numbers. Um, and I, I was inspired by our fantastic translators, who are absolutely amazing and brilliant. Um, so now you can get the slides in Italian as well. So and you can just jump around to each of the slides, and they've, I've done them all. They they help me out. It's it's brilliant. So uh, thank you very much. <laughs>